Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Nick Fimster. Uh, he, Nick is uh, a tenured associate professor at Georgia Tech, and he's been working on a lot of, sort of uh, interesting um, uh, research problems related to network systems, including network architecture, protocol design, security, management, measurement, anti-censorship. Okay, so um, to many of you, Nick is not a stranger, right? Uh, but to properly introduce him, uh, I downloaded uh, his most recent CV, which is 43 pages long. <laughs> so I spent some time studying uh, his CV. And so Nick has published nine journal papers, 39 uh, referred uh, conference papers, 27 workshop papers, and five best paper awards. And he has... Uh, he has received many sort of prestigious awards, including NSF uh, Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, um, and you know, like the usual things like you know, a Career Award, a Sloan Fellowship, uh, and IBM Faculty Award, or whatnot. Okay, so you might think that oh, you know, Nick must have been out there for many years, <laughs> but to give you a reference point, uh, he was uh, chosen as. This is this MIT Technology Review Top Innovators Under 35 in 2010. And uh, so to add a little bit of, sort of personal touch, uh, Nick and I shared an office at MIT for many years. And seeing him sort of working day and night, week and weekdays, I thought that you know, I was the biggest slacker in the world. And you know, after reading his CV today, I feel the same way again. <laughs> oh, well. OK, so without further ado, Nick. Thanks, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I didn't know any of those statistics. Uh, <laughs> um, great, so hopefully I can, I can teach you some things today about, uh, about um, what I call the battle for control of online communication. Uh, this work, uh, you'll see, has several facets, um, and it's joint work with uh, several of my students, um, as well as some other faculty members at, at Georgia Tech who work in uh, both sec areas of security and, and machine learning. So. Um, We'll, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, you know where I'm. Where I bring those uh, uh, elements of computer science into the work that I do um, uh, in in various portions of the talk, and I'll try to point those out as we go. Um, briefly, before I get into the the technical part of the talk, I just want to talk to you sort of broadly about um, what all those papers are kind of about and uh, the general approach I take to my work. So, um, generally speaking, I. I Try to, I pursue problems in, in an area that I call network operations and security. And the, the idea there is basically like, how do you design tools, algorithms, techniques to help people uh, run networks better? And in particular, secure them better, uh, make them perform better, make them easier to, to troubleshoot when things go wrong, et cetera. And the flavor of work that I, that I um, tend to do uh, um, basically draws inspiration for, uh, for the problems from uh, domain knowledge. So I like to basically. Um, talk uh, and, and uh, sort of interact extensively with people in uh, the network operations community um, and other, other folks in the trenches. So for example, uh, for those of you who, who are familiar with who've worked in networking, you've of course heard of the Net North American Network Operators Group. I talk with operators there to, to, um, to sort of identify practical problems with, with hard underlying questions. There are under other groups that I tend to work with as well, uh, like the Message Abuse uh, uh, Working Group. Um, as well as uh, campus network operators and so forth. So um, I try to basically spend some time um, with uh, people in the real world uh, of networks to try to understand what uh, sort of practical problems exist that potentially have some kind of hard underlying question. Um, those problems tend to be pretty messy in, 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 in practice, of course. So then basically what, what I aim to do uh, with my research is to try to abstract those problems and model them and in, 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 uh, redu in reduce them in to uh, problems that are easier for, for us to, um, to understand and model. Um, uh, and I'll present several examples of how we do, do that uh, you know, in, in, the, in the problems that I'll discuss today. Um, then sort of you know, having come up with some kind of, uh, and, and typically in um, trying to devise solutions to these problems, um, the work that I do 
um, I, I basically try to draw, draw on a number of techniques from, from other areas of computer science, not just networking. So in particular, as I mentioned, um, security is um, uh, another area, but also machine learning um, as well. And I'll, 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 I'll describe that in a little bit more detail. Having um, sort of come up with a solution, uh, um, however, I, I find it's not quite the end of the story. What I then try to do with that solution is to try to um, engage with, uh, with industry and transfer, transfer um, what, we, what we've come up with on paper into practice in a number of ways. And um, in particular, I'll, again, I'll point out um, in various aspects of the work um, where we've basically taken some of the algorithms and um, uh, features that I've identified um, in, um, in various contexts and, and worked with uh, a bunch of um, uh, folks in industry to transfer some of our findings into practice. So that's kind of the general approach I take to, to problems. And, and uh, sort of broadly speaking, uh, there are a number of, uh, if you sort of go to the trenches and sort of figure out what, you know, ask what kind of hard problems exist, there are a number of hard problems that, that uh, or practical problems with kind of hard underlying questions that I've pursued. Um, in particular, this is the, the one that I'll focus on today, which is like there's this balance between how the Internet has been designed to be open um, and that, that openness actually on the flip side makes it, makes it uh, you know, uh, more prone to, to attacks of various kinds. And figuring out ways to sort of appropriately balance that um, uh, is, is sort of the general sort of high-level theme to the talk. There are a bunch of other problems that I've, I've uh, worked on with, with uh, with my students, and, and if there's time towards the end of the talk, which um, you know maybe there won't be, uh, I will I will elaborate on some of those as well. So that's that's the hard question that I want to focus on today, and and um, um, I just want to briefly point out some of the areas that you'll see um, in today's talk. So um, I will spend my time focusing a lot on spam filtering and and, and message abuse, and in in that work. Um, We've basically drawn on some techniques both from, from the theory community and, and uh, machine learning community to develop uh, techniques um, to, to sort of uh, combat uh, uh, problems in that area. Also, um, I'll spend some time talking about uh, problems in anti-censorship and maintaining, uh, maintaining availability in the face of adversaries who want to disrupt communication and, and, and again, have sort of worked with, with folks across areas in that um, in that domain. And I'll talk a little bit about some more recent work that we've been doing with propaganda and, 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 um, and filtering. So the, the, I think the, the, the um, sort of powerful facet to, to this line of work is that, you know, um, there are a lot of adversaries out there who would wish to uh, sort of disrupt, just disrupt communication, abuse the network for their own purposes, etc. And we, uh, the good news here is that we can use tools from various aspects of computer science to, uh, in, in some sense, level the playing field. Okay, so let me come back a little bit to this, to this bigger question, like the, the, the uh, sort of tension between the openness of the Internet design and uh, how that openness sort of makes it more vulnerable to attack. So first, what do I mean by openness? Well, I think um, this quote from the, the, the director of the Media Lab, which was in the, in the New York Times not too long ago, really defines uh, um, sort of um, the, the, um, the ethos of, of, of the Internet design, which is to say that... Um, you know, everyone should be able to, to, uh, to connect, to innovate, to program without ask, ask, asking anyone's permission. Right? There's no central control, and the assets are widely distributed. There isn't one particular owner. Right? So um, that's good. Uh, there are many good things about that. Right? And, and the, the, the positive aspect to that is that this openness has catalyzed just a huge amount of innovation. Right? So the number of users on the Internet are, is growing. Uh, the internet is expanding to you know to many many different geographies, and of course we're seeing connect you know the ability to connect from all kinds of different devices. Um, the flip side, though, so what I want to talk about in, in this talk is is the flip side of that coin, which is uh, which is how openness facilitates uh, abuse and manipulation. Are you assuming a causal link where it actually may not exist? Uh, in particular, I'm kind of thinking of just the rise of mobile platforms. That is that is essentially the pace of that is fascinating. Um, and those platforms are, by traditional measures, closed. But they're still being adopted. The number of users they're getting is mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. Not just like today's platform, but even yeah. like the older cell phones, the feature phones. You couldn't change them in any way. They did some fixed set of things. And the adoption rates were way better than the internet. Yeah. <coughs> so where, what is the role of openness here if those platforms are not open? I think specifically here, like we could think of openness as being an, uh, the IP stack. So. Um, in particular, even though you know many aspects of those platforms remain closed, 
um, if you're able to implement an IP stack, you can get the you can get a device online, right? And I, I think that's that's just, that's I guess to focus the the tension, that's really what I'm talking about here. But feature phones took off without an IP stack. Feature phones, like regular dumb phones. Okay. They okay. took off without an IP sure. without an IP stack. Sure. Now I'm, I I I don't I wouldn't say that like this is a necessary condition for 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 growth, right? I mean there are plenty of there are plenty of technologies and platforms that have grown with, without being open. I would say that in, in the case of the internet, though, it's, it's certainly um, acted as a catalyst. Right now, there, are, there may be other things that have caused the growth as well. But certainly, I, I don't think you can argue that it that has hurt. Um, I could, but that's it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good. OK. Well, um, but that, so that's not. Um, really, what I want to talk about today, I really want to focus on the flip side of of, of this uh, of the coin, which is that uh, by virtue of the fact that that the internet is open, um, and and specifically to to what I was just mentioning, the fact that pretty much anyone with an IP stack can connect and start to send traffic, um, that facilitates abuse um, manipulation of of different kinds, um, and that's sort of the central central question that I want to focus on today. I want to talk about this, this, uh, this tension in the context of, of a couple of problems. And the first is uh, securing communication. So in particular, um, I'll speak about message abuse. So um, depending on the statistics that you choose to believe, um, you know, um, anywhere from something like 80 to 95% of email traffic is spam, while, not, while you may not see it uh, in your inbox, the network operators who are running those services definitely do see it, um, and they have to do something about it so that so that it doesn't end up in your you know right in front of your face. Um, so this remains this remains uh, you know um, uh, sort of a, a potential uh, continual vexing problem, and I'll I'll spend probably the 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 bigger balance of the talk talking about um, things that we've done in that area to to sort of combat that. Um, the second topic that I want to speak about is is uh, you know. Uh, on, on the flip side, maintaining openness. How do how do we um, uh, ensure or, or how do we help uh, parties communicate in the face of uh, organizations, countries, governments, etc., who would wish to uh, block or disrupt that that kind of um, that communication? So you may or may not know that something like 60 countries around the world um, control or censor uh, internet communications in some form. Um, so this is a this is a um, uh, a problem that's that's fairly fairly pervasive for for uh, for citizens of many countries. I won't spend too much time uh, on this last topic, but this is something that's become a recent in interest of mine. Is um, in um, uh, you know sort of the sort of more subtle uh, one of the more subtle aspects or facets to information control is not just the ability you know the decision to block or permit a certain type of communication, but rather um, uh, you know. There's there's p the potential to say manipulate what a particular user sees uh, when they go searching for a particular thing or when they read a particular you know um, piece of content or news story or blog post etc. And um, uh, I will talk a little bit about some, some more recent work that we've been doing to uh, try to help uh, maintain transparency that, so that users can you know hopefully become more aware of that type of that, those types of manipulations. Okay, so let me jump into the first topic of of, uh, of spam filtering. So as I mentioned already, spam is um, it's certainly um, a nuisance. It's becoming less of a nuisance for us because we hardly see it. Um, but just because you don't you don't see it doesn't mean it isn't there. Uh, it still remains about ninety five percent of all email traffic, and a lot uh, you know significant fraction of that traffic is you know uh, of that of that spam is coming in forms that that uh, um, you know uh, uh, creative forms you might say. I'll explain in just a little bit why that's that's relevant to this to this particular talk. Um, so uh, the other thing I guess that's, that's that's relevant is that a lot of this spam is coming from compromised machines or or um, uh, networks of compromised machines, commonly called botnets. Um, and uh, on one hand, that's a bit of a scourge, uh, but on the other hand, we're going to be able to use that to our advantage when we talk about how do we how do we sort of separate the good from the bad here. Um, okay, so the general approach to the to um, to uh, the problem of, of spam is let's filter it, right? This is sort of the obvious thing, right? Obviously, you want to basically take the unwanted traffic and tease it apart from the bad stuff. Um, um, I'm sorry, you want to take the good stuff and tease it apart from the bad stuff. Um, and the question, of course, what's that? Exactly. Um, and then the question then is what what features best differentiate the spam from from legitimate mail? Um, 
there have been, this is not a new question, right? This has been studied for, you know, you know uh, since essentially the advent of, uh, of email. Uh, and there have been certainly, there's a large body of work in, in various types of uh, approaches to this problem. I'll talk about a couple of uh, existing approaches to this problem uh, and sort of where that leaves, uh, you know, why there's still some room for improvement even, even given these techniques. Uh, the first, and I'll, I'll go into this um, uh, just briefly in the coming slides, is, is uh, content-based filtering. So you can, you can, for example, design a filter that looks at the content of a message, i.e. what's being said, and try to figure out based on what's in the message whether or not this is something that the user is going to want to see or not. The other thing you could do is, sort of, is you could, you know, if there's a, you know, a mail server connecting to, um, to your receiving mail server, you could look at the IP address of the sender, right, and try to put that on a, on a, uh, a blacklist, right? So you could develop a reputation for that IP address and say, you know, based on the behavior of this IP address in the past, I think this is good or bad. Um, the, the approach that we take and the approach I'm going to focus on um, in, in, um, in this talk is, is complementary, and that's basically to say, well, we can also look at features of the behavior, right? So we can basically say, you know, not just what's being said or, or, or um, you, know, what, you know, who's sending it, but how is the message being sent in terms of, you know, uh, what time of day is it, you know, what time of day is it being sent, at, what, what ISP is it coming from, you know, what other kinds of behavioral kinds of patterns can we see just in the network traffic that stand out. The intuition here is that, um, that spammers send, s fundamentally act in ways that differ from you or I um, act. And we should be able to, if we can identify, you know, um, what those features are and how they stand out, we can key off of those to design, to design, um, to design filters as well. So let me first talk a little bit about the, the other two, quickly talk about the other two approaches and kind of where they leave, leave some room for improvement. So content-based filters, as I mentioned, um, uh, look at what's being said. And one of the things uh, to, to real about, uh, realize about that, if you sort of talk to the op operator of a, a large mail service provider, uh, for example, uh, folks we've talked to include um, Yahoo, Secure Computing, et cetera, what they will tell you is that there's something like 100,000 different ways of spelling Viagra, right? Um, that's sort of just to illustrate the point of you know how how difficult this type of thing uh, can be right and how asymmetric the attack is right so um, the issue here and here's some examples of other ways that spammers use uh, content to sort of turn the battle in their favor right so they they can take a message and embed it in a PDF or an Excel spreadsheet or an image uh, or even an MP3 right and um, on the fl on one side it's fairly easy for um, a spammer to embed a message in a new type of, of uh, you know, um, carrier, if you will. On the flip side, the filter maintainers have to design ways to um, understand, parse, extract, et cetera, from different types of content. So this is uh, certainly something that, um, that uh, email service providers spend a lot of time doing, but it's, something more, it's, it's, it's definitely an aspect where the, the, um, uh, the battle is a little bit tilted in the spammer's favor because favor due to due to uh, uh, the fact that the, um, you know it's relatively easy to evade uh, these you know uh, content filter in comparison to sort of updating the, the capabilities of that filter. The second approach, as I mentioned, is you could you could take the IP address of the sender and you could try to b put that onto a uh, you know assign a reputation to that IP address. So if you were to look in your uh, mail headers, right, you would see something like. A what's called a received mail header. Of course, like if this message is coming from a spammer, you'd see a string of these things in the, in the mail header, and a lot of them would be forged. Uh, but at least um, one would think, I'll explain to you actually in, in a few slides why this is not always the case, but one would think that in most cases this, um, uh, this IP address that's, making, that's completing a TCP three-way handshake with you is the, is the IP address of you know, someone you think it is. Um, and if I could, you know, if, if the recipients could keep track of the behavior of any of those, you know, those particular IP addresses that are connecting to the server, then they can, you know, decide what, you know, what they think of that particular IP address. Is this a likely spammer or a legitimate sender? Now, um, that actually works pretty well. Um, there are, there are uh, large organizations that have, have, um, uh, have done pretty well at maintaining these kind of blacklists. But again, this is a bit of a cat and mouse game. Right? And the, the challenge here is that the IP addresses of, of email senders are never the same on any, any two given days, shall we say. When we, um, when we um, 
one of the th experiments that we did actually to study the behavior of, of these senders is actually we set up what's called a, uh, what we called a um, spam, uh, spam trap or a spam honeypot, if you will. Uh, it, was a, it was a mail server with, with several domains that had no legitimate email addresses. Um, so what, uh, what, a, what a typical mail server would do is basically just reject any attempts to send to non-existent mail ad um, ad email addresses. What we did in this case was basically accept any connection attempt. Right? Uh, and said, okay, thank you very much. We will deliver that. Um, in fact, we're delivering it to our spool, but to no one in particular, and then, and then gathering statistics on who's talking to us. Um, when we did that, right, we, see, we basically see that on, on any given day, there are about 10% of these senders coming from IP addresses that we hadn't seen in the past. Right? So um, that's sort of churn on, on the black hat side, if you will, the, the bad side of things, right? And there, there are possible causes for, for that type of thing happening. You know, um, we can't necessarily um, attribute the cause of the churn to any, any one thing in particular. But there are you know, malicious reasons for IP addresses uh, uh, changing on any given day. But uh, I'll take the question in just a minute. Um, but there are also good reasons why um, you might see email from an IP address you've never seen before. So for example, the renumber renumbering of a mail server. Or um, uh, someone d just decides to set up a mail server you know, that they, you know, on, you know, uh, on any particular day that they hadn't been, that they hadn't been operating in the past. Right? So there are re good reasons for IP addresses to, to suddenly start sending mail as well. So you can't just say, let's just blacklist everything that's new. Right? So coming back to the, um, to, to the sort of goal of openness, right? Um, you, you know, and, and, and the desire to keep your false positives low, this becomes the, the, the ephemerality of the IP addresses also presents a problem. Yeah, I was, you headed where I was going, which is you can't paint 95% of the internet black and still call it open. Correct. Exactly. Exactly. So, so that's essentially where, where that, this leaves some room for improvement. So you, um, you started off saying that, and, and it's true that most of us don't see a lot of spam, be it because of Gmail or Hotmail getting pretty good at doing mm -hmm. these approaches. Who actually does see the spam? And why are there um, mail servers not doing even these basic things, which would cut down most of the spam and then drag the spam economy down? So um, these basic things actually turn out to cut, cut about 80% of connection attempts. So you can basically take an IP blacklist and still, um, you know, uh, I guess a, a not so well-known fact is that um, Operational mail ser servers do drop about 80% of the incoming connections just based on things like IP reputation. Um, the, so the dirty secret behind what I'm, what I'm presenting to you here is actually that um, the gains are somewhat incremental, right? Because um, you're taking th that 80% that's already, you know, the, you're taking the 20% on which the early decision hasn't been made, and you're basically trying to crank that up a bit, right? So I think the answer to your question is that, um, yeah, already this is being done to quite some degree. And we're basically looking for other features, et cetera, that can help us gain you know, additional advantage. Um, yeah. but, but then if no one's, more or less no one's seeing the spam, then shouldn't the spam rates go down to zero? I mean, how, how do they still support? Well, the, 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 the issue is that actually there's still about 20% of the connections that do, uh, you know, that do get accepted. Now of that, then content filters, et cetera, get applied. Right, so you're basically, you may not be seeing a, a, there's some fraction of that that users do see. It's actually quite small, right? But then the other stuff that you never see also presents a problem as well because you've got to store it, right? So, um, so there are operational challenges as well. Like once you've basically decided to accept a message for delivery, you've got to do something with it. And the more you can basically shave that down as well, the better off the operators of the service are as well. Yeah. Maybe some people do click this Viagra ad spam, right? So maybe my spam is not his spam. Correct. So, you know, as long as those people exist, yeah. it may be hard to uh, eliminate the spam because some people do want to receive the right. spam. I think if no one were clicking on them, then obviously, then obviously that would be the end of story, right? Uh, but um, there has to be some small fraction of people who are. Who are actually buying the stuff, yeah. What was the scale of the gathering here? I mean, 10% new every day is like, I mean, it's hard to imagine, say, the Hotmail and Gmail are seeing that level of new IP addresses. How, how, how long was your time window, and kind of what did you do to advertise the, these mail servers? Uh, so this is like, um, so 
advertising is a tricky, tricky thing, actually. Um, I mean, we basically, um, as it turns out, a lot of the, a lot of the um, baiting seems to come from who is scraping, right? Looking at newly registered domains, because we did actually put the domains out there, and that, to, to not much effect for a while, actually. Um, basically, uh, oh, so what was the question? The scale. Um, like how long? Did, I mean, did it actually plateau? So, I mean, how long a time it took? Okay, so we did this over the course of uh, uh, over the course of about four months. Uh, so yeah, you're right that it, that eventually it's bound to plateau because there are a limited number of IP addresses out there. That was your plateau range, right? Yeah, that was our plateau range. Yeah. Gmail yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, eventually they'd have to, right? Because they're going to see a lot more um, on any given day. In fact, maybe they're plateau after a day. Um, um, yeah. Okay. So um, so that's basically where um, where uh, you know where the state of the art is and, and where there's some room for improvement. So um, as I mentioned, this is, this is essentially the approach that we're taking. And uh, if, if you're going to talk about um, use, like looking at network level behavior to try to, to try to do detection, the obvious question then is, well, what's different about the spammers? Right? So it sounds nice. right? Intuitively, spammers aren't like us. Presumably, they should behave differently. But what exactly is it about them that looks different? Right. And um, what I'm going to talk about is sort of three different ways that we've observed spammers behaving differently from legitimate senders. Um, and intuitively, they make sense. And what I'm going to try to do is sort of drill down into each of these and show how we've taken these kind of um, axioms, if you will, and derived more, more features, uh, more low-level features and, and detection mechanisms based on this intuition. The first is what I call agility. And the idea here is that spammers actually have to move to escape detection. Right. So if spammers always sent from the same IP addresses, send email from the same IP addresses, if they always hosted their um, pill sites and uh, phishing sites at the same URLs or the same domains, et cetera, then eventually all those places would end up on blacklists or shut down, and uh, things wouldn't work so well. So spammers actually have to move around to, to escape detection. Right? So on the one hand, that's kind of inconvenient, right? because you create this cat and mouse game where, where um, you continually have to, you know, with the techniques I've already described, you continually have to update, um, update uh, blacklists and so, and so forth um, to keep up with that. But on the flip side, what we can do is actually uh, recognize that the way that spammers change uh, where, they're, you know, where they're doing things, uh, where they're performing their activities, differs from the way that anything else on the internet changes. Right? So, and I'm going to basically use that, um, uh, that intuition to, to show you some particular features that really stand out in terms of the, the spammer behavior. Um, the second is that spammers just send mail in ways that, that you and I don't, right? So um, just in terms of the way that they send messages to people look a lot different. And the other sort of keys, the, the, the last one sort of keys off the idea that, that, um, that or, or sort of the observation that spam, a lot of spam is coming from these botnets, these networks of compromised machines. Right? And as a result of that, what, what we can see is some coordination Right, that that wouldn't er wouldn't otherwise pop out from from groups of legitimate senders. The obvious thing here, right, and one of the things that we study is that sending behavior actually exhibits some coordination. But I'll show you actually another pretty uh, cool and interesting uh, example of coordination that also popped out as well when we get to that part of the talk. Um, so I'm going to first talk about agility. In particular, I'll talk about how um, spammers have used um, uh, various um, internet protocols to move around. Then I'll talk about um, how we've, uh, how, you know, different aspects of spammer behavior that look different from uh, legitimate senders, and how we built um, supervised learning classifiers on top of that to uh, help, you know, help differentiate spammer behavior from that, that of legitimate senders. And then I'll talk about uh, some of the behaviors that tend to cluster well. Um, just to sort of uh, whet your appetite here. Um, I'll, uh, one, of the, one of the coordination behaviors, actually, that, that we're going to uh, key off of is that spammers actually send mail to themselves. Uh, so think about that for, for a while, and then I'll, I'll come back to it. So um, let's first talk about agility. So one of, the th um, one of the things that we observed, and this, this comes back to the, to, the, to the data collection method that, that I, I spoke about before, right? So basically what we could do is um, set up a uh, spam honeypot, if you will, a spam trap, and see who's sending us messages. And the other thing we could do is sort of join that with uh, our view of what the internet routing table looks like at any particular to any particular point, and then ask: Is there any kind of uh, is there any kind of uh, correlation between these two things that we observe? 
So here's something that we see, and I'll, I'll, I'll point these things out as, as, as I walk through this example. So when we look at the internet routing table, one of the things that we, that, we, um, that, that we saw actually is an advertisement for an IP prefix that lasted only about 10 minutes. So uh, for those of you who don't know what BGP is, by the way, I should, should have just mentioned, it stands for Border Gateway Protocol. And this is the, the uh, language that ISPs use to talk to, to one another to sort of advertise reachability to a range of IP addresses, right? So they can say, hey, I know how to reach this range of IP addresses. Uh, please send your traffic through me to get there. Okay, so what we see here between this red dot and the blue dot, so the red dot is an example of an ISP saying, come through me to, to reach this set of IP addresses. And the blue, blue dot is like 10 minutes later, you see a retraction of that statement. It's called a withdrawal message. And um, this is already looking kind of weird, right? Because you see um, an, a, a range of IP addresses that's advertised for a very short period of time. When we run networks, typically we'd like to have our network up for more than 10 minutes, right? So already this is kind of looking kind of uh, a little bit strange. Um, then the next thing we saw is um, if we sort of look at what's happening in that range of IP addresses in terms of who's trying to talk to us, we saw something kind of interesting. We saw, in this case, you know, five different, uh, you know, in this particular episode, five different IP addresses contained within that part of the network that are talking to us, like sending us spam, right? So this is pretty strange, right? You have a short-lived, you know, a, a network where the reachability is extremely short-lived, and then inside that 10-minute window, you see some activity. Now, that's weird enough in and of itself, uh, but then um, if, if I were to ask you if you were to steal a region of IP address uh, space, uh, would you steal a big region or a small region, right? And we thought really, you know, probably you'd steal a small region of IP addresses because, you know, smaller and people are less likely to notice. Um, in fact, actually, this behavior, this particular behavior, we observed the opposite, right? So we actually saw this, these short-lived announcements popping up for like huge regions of, of IP addresses, um, slash eights, or um, w about one two fifty sixth of the entire internet address space was being advertised you know, in this sort of short-lived uh, way. And you're thinking like, what the heck? Like, isn't someone going to notice if someone like steals one two fifty sixth of the internet? Well, this is kind of brilliant attack-wise, right? Because because of the way internet routing works, right? We know. Um, you know, for, for those of you who know how it works, you know that it works on what's called longest prefix match, right? And the idea is that if, if there's some network that's advertising a more specific range of addresses, right, then that's always going to win, right? The, the routers will continue to forward to the guy who's advertised the more specific space. Meanwhile, the attacker who's grabbed this sort of, you know, you know less specific space, right, suddenly got a huge chunk of addresses that isn't likely to be filtered because it's a big chunk, right? Uh, you know, shorter prefixes tend not to be filtered. These things are actually allocated, right, as well, so it doesn't look too fishy, uh, um, or at least no fishier than, 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 uh, <laughs> than it might otherwise look. Um, and they get a huge chunk of addresses. Anything that's not being advertised by, you know, some other existing network, suddenly, basically, they've owned, right? So that, that tends to be convenient. So, so why aren't these uh, attackers sophisticated enough to look at the BGP table from RockViews or somewhere else and pick out more specific address blocks that are not being advertised? and just advertise those? Um, I think they probably could, right? I mean, it seems like, seems like uh, that, um, that might work. One thing, though, um, like um, one reason that might not work is sometimes, um, uh, sometimes operators do set up their filters to filter you know, more specific regions if they turn out to be shorter, right? So um, that might be one reason why it might not work. But it's, it's actually... I wouldn't say that it's, you know, I can't say that it's not happening as well, right? Uh, it may be happening as well. It's a good question. Okay. So since the study was done in six years ago, has the situation changed? So we most recently looked at this um, uh, last year as well. So there's still a significant fraction of, uh, um, I'm sorry, there's still a significant number of short-lived IP addresses that are, uh, that are also sourcing attack traffic of different kinds, both spam and, and other types of scans. So I haven't looked at it in the last year, but this is like behavior persists uh, up until about a year ago. So how do you propose to defend against So um, uh, that's, a tri that's a tricky question, actually. It touches a little bit on um, uh, <laughs> the later part of the talk, right? Um, I could spend 
quite a bit of time talking about the philosophy here, right? I mean, obvious thing to do is like to, is is to sort of um, design better filters, or uh, I'm sorry, be more vigilant about updating the filters, right? Of course, we know that that's tricky, right? <laughs> but that would be kind of the ideal situation. Now, another thing you could do is talk about something like secure BGP, right? Where you know every, you can't ad actually advertise a prefix without it actually being you know you know signed and attributed to a particular network. I actually think that um, there are some, you know, stones unturned there as far as, like, the, you know, that isn't necessarily a panacea, right? Who's, then basically who's deciding who's allowed to announce what? I mean, I think that that doesn't necessarily solve things. You, you potentially create a situation where things are less open. So I think the right answer, which is probably unattainable, is have operators, you know, be more vigilant about, about updating their filters. Um, but maybe there's a better answer to that that we just haven't thought of yet. Um, okay, so that's that's one example. Um, another thing that I that I mentioned that I was going to talk about was um, when when spammers send messages, right? They um, obviously want uh, someone to click on something, buy buy something, right? Um, in order to do that, they need to host a site somewhere, right? They need to host a website that's the Canadian pharmacy or you know, the fishing site or what have you, and um, the the um, the way that the, the, the problem with just hosting a site in any particular place, right, is, um, is that if you leave it in that place for too long, it, you know, this, the, uh, the uh, infrastructure will be blacklisted and shut down. Right? So um, what attackers uh, say about that or what they, what they do in response to that is actually use the naming infrastructure to move their infrastructure around. So this is, this is a picture taken from, from the HoneyNet project. and. Um, Basically, um, there, there are two ways that this can be done. One is um, you could just use the DNS in, in sort of the normal load balancing style way, right? When, when, a, when a client looks up a particular domain, right, you can return different IP addresses, right? You can for the, for, so you can change the IP address that's in the A record, and that's called sing, uh, often called single flux. It's kind of like a black hat load balancing, right? Now, the, pr the problem with that approach, right, is actually that... Um, you know this thing right here, the the author what's called the authoritative name server for that particular domain, that isn't moving around as well, right? So if I were to to try to you know identify what's going on here and shut things down, I could blacklist this you know I could blacklist this particular authoritative name server. Uh, what the what the attackers do in response to that, of course, is then just take this thing and move it onto a botnet, right? And and start moving this thing around. So you can no longer. Uh, you know, blacklist a, you know the IP address of, a, of, an, of an authoritative name server, right? So on the one hand, that's kind of you know um, inconvenient, but on the other hand, you can imagine that there are, there are not very many legitimately operated networks that perform this you know this type of behavior. So um, in particular, um, th what we can do then is look for um, uh, cases where the infrastructure, in particular the IP address of the, you know, this stuff up here, the IP address of the authoritative name server is moving around, right? And actually this is work that, uh, that uh, Jay Yun and I did with a, with a student of mine several years ago. So what we did actually in this case is we looked at the domains coming into our spam trap, right? And we repeatedly queried those domains and we asked like, how often is it the case that the authoritative name server for that domain is, is, uh, is moving around, right? So this is just one, one result from that study. What we can see here, and this is basically a, a CDF of the inter-arrival time between the changes at the, you know, at the, of the authoritative name servers in that hierarchy, and you can see for the, um, uh, you know, for the for the the red line is basically the domains that are that are coming into our spam trap. You can see that in about um, you know half of those cases, uh, the IP address of the authoritative name server is changing about once every six hours. So not something you'd expect to see on a legitimate network. And it, as you can see, it differs quite a lot from, from sort of the, the legitimate domains. So that's one, one type of uh, DNS agility. Another, of course, uh, uh, is that the attackers, of, of course, can't continue to use the same domains, right? Because the domain name itself is also going to end up on a blacklist eventually, too. So they've got to continually register new domains. Um, so that's inconvenient, but on the, what we can do on the, on, on the flip side there is look for what's different about, you know, these new domains. Well, um, to get you thinking about that, I could ask, well, what happens when you register a domain? Um, who looks it up? T typically nobody, right? When you first register a domain and no one's heard of it, right? Um, no one's looking it up except for maybe you. What happens when a... Um, 
when an attacker registers a new domain? Well, um, it might get enlisted as part of a scam uh, campaign, right? It might get, you know, it might be used for botnet command and control. So there are things that are looking it up. So we can use that initial lookup behavior to provide kind of an early reputation for, for some of these newly registered domains. And that's, that's what we did. So for this, of course, you need uh, special uh, data. <laughs> if you will, you need a special vantage point. So we did this in, in uh, collaboration with some folks from VeriSign um, who, have a nice, who have a nice view of the recursive resolvers uh, looking up uh, second level domains um, in .com and .net. So what we did here is we asked for those newly registered domains, um, who's looking them up within the, first, uh, within the first week of registration? And you can see, um, and by who, I mean how many distinct slash 24 networks. And you can see in this case that um, in about 40% of the cases, 40% um, uh, uh, of those newly registered domains, there's something like several hundred unique slash 24 networks or more looking it up uh, almost right away. And that um, essentially never, almost never happens with these legitimate, le legitimately registered domains. Okay, so um, now I want to talk a little bit about the second, the second uh, uh, axiom, which is that spam, the way that spammers actually send mail uh, differs from the way that you and I tend to send mail. Um, what we eventually did in this part of the work was, was come up with a uh, supervised uh, classifier based on supervised learning um, uh, to distinguish spammers from legitimate senders. And the challenge here becomes how do you identify the features that, uh, the behavioral features that differ um, between legitimate senders and, and spammers. Uh, what I'm going to do is just show you a couple of highlights uh, because there are a bunch of features that tend to work well. A lot of them are kind of obvious and boring, right? So for example, one of the things you can do is look at the, I, the ISP or the AS of the, the sender, right? And that tends to work pretty well. Um, but, but I'll focus on a couple of the ones that, look, that, that are more interesting because they tell us a little bit more about, about how, um, you know, how they, they provide a little insight in terms of how spammers tend to behave. So, one of them was, what, what, what we did actually was take the um, source, and, and uh, I should mention the data that we used for this uh, part of the study. This was work that we did in collaboration with McAfee, who um, has um, mail filtering appliances deployed in something like 8,000 different enterprise networks. These are globally, globally distributed. So this is biased, of course, by where they've got their, you know, their mail filtering appliances distributed. But um, this is just to sort of um, also kind of paint a picture of, of um, uh, you know, an example of, the t of, of, of where the behavior may differ. So one of the things that we saw, for example, is that about 90% of the legitimate messages travel, you know, um, you know, in a relatively close proximity. If you look at the um, spam, spammer behavior, actually, it's significantly more, you know, uh, more evenly distributed across distance. Another thing that we looked at is, and, and this sort of comes back again to the fact that spam is being sent from compromised uh, machines, right? We looked at... Um, how email is being sent from different regions of IP address space. So um, again, to sort of paint the intuition here, um, it's, it's fairly unlikely that you'd have a network, say a slash 24 network, with 200 legitimate mail servers on it, right? Uh, typically, you'd expect you know, you know, a handful at most, right? On the other hand, what we were seeing in the cases of spam activity were these slash 24 networks or you know, networks of, of such a size where there'd be 200 email senders, right, in fairly close proximity, you know, in, 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 that, in that particular slash 24. Um, it makes sense when you think about how spammers, you know, use the infrastructure to operate, right? They compromise a bunch of machines, and then they enlist them to, to, to start, you know, uh, launching these types of campaigns. So what we can do is actually um, key off of that behavior to, to, again, sort of design a feature, a behavioral feature that allows us to distinguish spammers from legitimate senders. In particular, what we did in this case was to say, when you see a piece of email sent, you know, how, far apart, how far away in IP address space do you need to go before you see the K next nearest senders? Right? And then the, for a particular value of K, um, you know, the smaller that IP address range, or that, that, that space, in, uh, that IP space is, the more, dense, uh, the more dense that sending activity is. And that's essentially what we see here. So, so I'm having trouble with understanding the graph and with the intuition, because I've got to assume that Gmail, Hotmail, and large companies have lots of, uh, well, large companies have lots of Outlook servers, and yeah. Gmail and Hotmail have lots of IPs. What is being sampled here? Uh, okay, so basically the way to read this is like, um, uh, what is the data point? so, 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 yes, yeah, so, 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 so the way to read this is how far, this is how far out in IP address space do you need to go, right, to, to observe the K 
closest email senders. Right? So for example, if I take a particular IP address right, of a sender, so I can say IP not email? The, the data is IP addresses here. Right? Yeah, I, IP addresses of senders. So you could say, for example, in the case of, um, you know, in the case of uh, spammers, right, to see the K closest, you know, to see the K closest email senders, um, I need to go out, you know, I need to capture sort of 20,000 or so IP addresses surrounding that, that, um, uh, that IP address. I've got to go basically two orders, uh, you know, an order of magnitude more for, to, to see 10 email senders um, if I start from a legitimate, a legitimate sender. Um, your question about um, webmail providers is an interesting one. I'd say that's the exception rather than the rule. Um, Right, um, there are, there are only a few of those, um, and there are a lot more, you know, there are a lot more email senders who are not those people because we're not talking about volumes here. We're talking about activity. Hmm? So this is this a is a mean. A, this is a mean. Why, why do I care about the mean? Um, because it's it. I mean, there's a, there's a difference here that's clearly that's that's represented, right? Um, sure, but yeah. you can have a very high mean, but you could right. still have a bottom ten percent. That's a real problem. So if you have a lot of large companies with a bunch of out, you know, or a right. reasonable number right. that have right. 10 Outlook servers, right. then it, as far as the ability to use this as a heuristic goes down dramatically. So I would say that I would posit that the number of networks that, like the number of legitimately operated networks that have more than, you know, more than, you know, a handful of mail servers for, for several hundred IP addresses is not that many. Um, I mean, your typical enterprise network, which is basically what we're looking at here, Right, because you remember the data set we're looking at. We're looking at um, uh, um, mail from enterprise networks, right? Um, uh, you know where these spam filtering boxes have been deployed. We're not talking about Gmail or Hotmail or, or Yahoo in this case, um, right? But if you look at sort of the typical enterprise network or campus network or what have you, the type of place that's likely to deploy a filter of this type, you're not going to have a very dense. You know, you're not going to have dense. Uh, uh, email sending activity. Take uh, the Georgia Tech campus, for example. There, I, you will not find a slash 24 network on that campus with 200 legitimate mail servers. That's essentially the intuition we're operating on here. Um, now, to your question about the mean, uh, you're very right. There are going to be outliers to this, and you've actually identified one of them. Um, so. In, that is basically why in the context of like designing a supervised, uh, a supervised learning classifier, you can't rely on just one feature. Right? So we don't look at means when we design the classifier. We use, this particular, we use this particular feature as an input among many of the other features as well. Right? So obviously you're not going to get it right every time. Just like in the case of distance, you're not going to get that right every time either. Um, but the point here is basically to point out a general trend um, that is true a lot of the time. Why is certain spam higher than likely spam? I expect that's kind of a, a labeling problem. Um, or it may be the case that there's you know, a lot more or a lot less of, of, one, of, those, uh, of one of those categories. Um, the way that the, la the data was labeled was actually sort of post hoc manual, um, semi-manual. Um, and we didn't do that. That was actually labels that were given to us. Yeah. OK. Um, OK, so. Um, uh, so that was, that, that's just to paint a picture of a couple of the features that we used. We used a whole bunch more um, that, I don't have, that I don't have the time to talk about. Once we put those into a supervised learning classifier, um, we, we, the um, false positive rate we get for, for if we basically look at the t detection rate that something like Spam House gets, we get about a four-tenth of one percent um, false positive rate, which is still a bit too high to be practical. Uh, most mail service providers like to see about one-tenth of one percent. Um, we can play other games like whitelisting ASs that, you know, for which we get the most strong answers, et cetera, et cetera, and tune a bunch of knobs to get that down to about 0.14% um, you know, uh, or so. But this is basically, I'm giving you a number that's basically just taking the features that we identified and turning the crank. We can actually do pretty well. Um, the features that I showed you, some of those features that I showed you also were used by, um, by uh, McAfee, who we worked with uh, in this particular pro uh, project, to you know, in in the mail filter that they use um, in practice. Okay, so um, finally, just to talk about coordination uh, a bit. So um, I'm glad you actually raised the point of webmail, actually, uh, because uh, as you point out, this is actually totally changing the game. Uh, 
in particular, as you, as you mentioned, <laughs> right, that particular feature that we talked about may not apply. But in general, the types of features that we studied in that work may, may not apply because a lot of them key off of IP addresses. So, but in fact, IP, IP blacklists aren't going to work either. <laughs> right? So um, there's an interesting thing that's going on, right? which is that now we can no longer use IP addresses or behavior, you know, the types of behavior that I mentioned. Well, what can we use? We can use user input. Right? We can use those like, you know, mark a spam button. Right? Uh, well, so what's the next step in, in, in that game? Right? Uh, well, so actually what we're, we're seeing now is that spammers are sending mail to themselves. Uh, you might think, why are they sending mail to themselves? Well, it's actually so that they can vote on their own messages. Right? So um, they send mail to themselves and then they basically vote not spam on the messages that they see. So this is, this is some work that, that we did with, with Yahoo. In particular, uh, over, the, about the course of uh, over the course of about three months, we saw about, uh, about a million and a half not spam votes coming from accounts that basically did nothing except vote not spam on anything. Right? So there's, there's um, a fair amount of this activity going on. But the other kind of interesting thing about this is that it doesn't take that much. Right? It really doesn't, you know, because the cost of a false positive is so high, right? anything that basically gets a not spam vote is, is you know, it really tweaks the weights. Right? So, um, what we want to do, of course, is try to detect those, um, those, uh, those fraudulent votes. Um, uh, and what we can do right, is actually um, make some observations about how those votes are being cast uh, to, try to, to try to distinguish uh, you know, like fraudulent, not spam votes from, from the legitimate ones. Um, this actually draws some inspiration from some work that's gone on here in terms of um, uh, detecting compromised accounts. Uh, through coordinated activity, in particular, the bot graph work is, um, you know, um, is is quite similar to the observation that I'm about to point out here. But um, what we can do actually is take this voting problem and model it as a bipartite graph, where the in, in gray here we have the IP addresses of spammers and legitimate senders, and those are IP addresses that are being voted on, and then we've got some user accounts that are actually, you know, casting the votes. Okay, so. <clears throat> What we can see with, with, you know, when we sort of uh, create this, this graph of activity is, is a couple things pop out. One, of course, is that you know, um, these compromised accounts tend to cast a lot more not spam votes than, than like a legitimate user typically would. But the other thing that really pops out is that spammer IP addresses, they actually tend to receive not spam votes from many different compromised accounts over here on the right side of the graph. Now, there's a circularity here, right? Because how do I know what's compromised before I figure out that one of these guys is being voted on from a bunch of compromised accounts? But you can break that circularity, of course, by clustering, right? We can basically look at you know, um, um, IP addresses over here that are being voted on, and we can say, um, are there groups of IP addresses here that are being voted on by a similar group of user I identities or user accounts on this side, right? And basically, we can, we can create a cluster based on um, the um, sort of observing the similarity of voting behavior there. So that's effectively what we did. Actually, we, we, um, we applied um, sort of a graph-based clustering approach to sort of tease apart uh, the user identities that vote in a similar fashion across many different IP addresses. Now, um, the approach that we started out with, and the same approach that BotGraph um, uses in their work to detect compromised accounts, is you can sort of uh, build a k-neighborhood graph. And the, the, um, the idea there is basically you, you, you figure out, um, you figure out um, instances of IP addresses for which you know, um, a particular user identity votes in the same way at least k different times. Right? And then you basically group, um, group user identities based on that value of k. The problem with that actually is, is, that, in the, uh, is that it can produce false positives. Right? So if you've got a group of, of um, good guys that are all kind of voting in the same way, and then you've got a bunch of, you've identified some fraudulent voters here, and you've got maybe one account in the good guys that has some strange voting, you know, strange behavior, either because it's coming through a proxy or, um, you know, maybe it happens to be compromised itself, right, something, then all of a sudden you basically take, you know, this whole cluster of good guys and you, and you sort of lump it in with the, with, with the bad guys. Um, so the, the problem with just sort of applying just a straight um, uh, k-neighborhood clustering is that, that false pos it's, it's hard to keep a, a handle on the false positives. What we can do to improve that approach is actually um, apply something called canopy clustering. And not an, I'm not an expert in this area, so I won't speak too much 
uh, to the details. But if, uh, at a high level, what canopy clustering allows you to do is, is sort of a two, it's, it, it allows you to apply clustering in two stages. Um, you basically create these, you know, um, you create these large, sort of larger groups of, of, of things to cluster on, and then you, you reapply K neighborhood clustering inside those, inside those things that are called canopies. That actually allows things to scale a lot better, so that's important here in this case where there's just a lot of mail and a lot of senders, but also you can keep a better handle on, on false positives. So this is actually something that, that, that we worked on with, uh, with the uh, folks at Yahoo, and this is something actually they use to try to, detect, to now detect these, these kind of fraudulent votes. Yes? Couldn't you also break the symmetry by actually looking at the messages and seeing whether they were spam, or does that not work? Um, you could do that, actually, I, I guess. Um, um, you bring so then effectively what you're doing is bringing a human in the loop to sort of see are you know or, or other, um, yeah or other techniques to analyze what's spam. True. Yeah, you could you could potentially do that as well. Yeah, that I think that's a good, that's a totally reasonable approach. Yeah, you do have to look at content and there's some cost to doing that, but I think that's probably doable. Um, or you could use other things. You, you could certainly do other things to look at a spam score based on other you know features of the header or what have you. Um, the problem with, so you could look at content, I think that would probably work okay. The once you sort of get away from content, you get back into this mess of now like everyone's sending email from Gmail to Gmail and Hotmail to Gmail and Hotmail to Yahoo and, and so forth, right? So a lot of the features that we typically key on that relate to the IP address and headers and stuff, they no longer work. So you kind of, ha it, you kind of have to dig into content to, um, to, really, to really take the approach that you're taking, but I think it's reasonable. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, just a time check. Actually, I know that we have not, uh, like a ninety-minute slot, but um, so uh, what? Uh, how do you want me to to sort of uh, proceed? I mean, I can finish in anywhere from three minutes to twenty, whatever you. Okay. Um, what I'll so what I'll do actually is um, uh, I wanted to to spend a few minutes then talking about this this this. Um, this other uh, this other problem, which is um, maintaining openness, in particular, um, uh, enabling uh, or sort of facilitating communication in the face of a sensor who would wish to sort of disrupt that communication. So um, this is a problem, of course, that's, that's uh, sort of uh, uh, enjoying increased prominence. And I'll sort of at a high level describe to you what um, what the problem is. Of course, Alice wants to talk to Bob. There's a sensor in the middle. Who would either wish to block that traffic, or uh, worse, potentially punish Alice for attempting to talk to Bob? Right. So I think that's where things actually get a little bit different than kind of the conventional types of um, uh, things that we've seen in this area. Because not only do we want to allow Alice to talk to Bob, but we also want to potentially conceal the fact that she's trying to do so in the first place. The general approach to allowing this, uh, to facilitating this communication, is to use some kind of helper, right? Where um, while Alice and Bob may not be allowed to talk directly to one another, um, Bob may be able to communicate with some kind of helper, right? And, and maybe Alice can talk to that helper as well, right? So the communication between Alice and that helper is somehow permitted. Um, the idea then is basically to use this point of indirection, right, to allow Alice and Bob to send each other messages. So the challenge here, right, and, and this is sort of a well-studied problem, right? Uh, the most famous helper, I think, is, is, uh, is uh, uh, a mixnet called Tor. Right? And, but the challenge there is that, you know, well, when using something like Tor, it's fairly easy to hide what you're getting, and sometimes it's, it can be easy to sort of break through sensors using those techniques. Um, if someone happens to be looking, right, if the sensor happens to be looking at that traffic, it can be very hard to hide that you're, u that you're doing, you know, that you're actually performing that kind of activity. Right? So one of the things that we've been doing over the years is actually try to, um, in, try to um, design communication techniques that defeat uh, censorship that are also deniable, right? In other words, that, pr that disguise the fact that Alice is using this, this kind of technique in the first place. So what I'm going to uh, do is actually talk about a particular, uh, a, a particular system that, that, that we've designed um, to, to achieve that goal. Um, there are a number of things that we want to achieve in the design of the system. One is, of course, we want to thwart uh, disruption, right? We want to make it difficult for the sensor to disrupt the communication. In order to do that, we use a combination of sort of redundancy techniques and, and hiding. Um, the other thing we want to do is make that activity, right, the act of Alice fetching that content or communicating with Bob, we want to make that look innocuous, right? And then we're going to steal some techniques from distributed systems. 
Finally, what we want to do is if a sensor is watching the communication between Alice and Bob, we actually want to make it sort of less obvious that they're talking to one another. So what we want to do is decouple you know, the sending and the receiving of the messages. So in the real world, what this might look like is you know, I want to send you a message, but I know someone's watching, right? And I want to make it not so obvious that I'm sending you a message. So what I do is I you know, put the message in a paper bag under the bridge, and I, you know, I tell you to go look there at some later point and pick it up. Right? So to someone who's observing, they, you know, they may not notice any correlation between who's dropping off the message and who's picking it up. So what this system I'm going to just briefly describe to you is essentially uh, paper bags under a bridge uh, for Web 2.0. <laughs> um, effectively, what we do is use uh, user-generated content sites to allow Alice and Bob to, to, to communicate with one another. So what Bob is going to do, in this case, Bob is, uh, we'll just say that he's a Flickr user. Flickr itself may be blocked. That's fine. I'm using Flickr for the sake of example and also because it's what we, we built our prototype on. But um, this could be any site that hosts user-generated content. So what Bob is going to do is take his message. He's going to actually uh, sort of embed it in some kind of content, right? whether it might be an image, a video, something like that. And he's going to post it on a user-generated content site. Now, Alice is basically going to retrieve that content. Right? And to the sensor, this is going to look like Alice is looking at videos of cats or you know, va you know, vacation photos or something. But when in fact, what she's really interested in is that thing that's hiding inside the cover. So, um, so let me just describe to you in, in just a little bit of detail how that works. And then I'll, I'll dive in to a couple challenges and then wrap up just uh, probably, probably five or ten more minutes. So Bob is going to take his message that he wants to send to Alice. And let's assume actually that... There's some message identifier that, that either Alice and Bob have agreed on or Alice already knows. So a message identifier might be, for example, a URL, right? For the, you know, the, the message that Bob's trying to put in might be the web page corresponding to that URL. Or if this is a particular message that Bob wants to, communi to communicate to Alice, the message ID is something that they would have had to agree on magically somehow out of band. So there's a bootstrapping step that I'm, that I'm hand waving over here. But let's assume that there's an identifier associated with that message. Well. Bob is going to take that message. He's going to take his cover traffic, um, in, in, in this case, maybe say a picture, right? He's going to embed the message in that, in that picture, um, in that cover traffic. He's going to upload it to some user generated content site, like the drop site, if you will. And Alice is basically just going to reverse this process to, to, to retrieve her message. OK, so that's the, that's the high level picture, right? Um, and there are a few challenges to making this work. One is figuring out how to embed the message, right? Which actually, um, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of, I'm gonna skip over because the 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 techniques that we use here are fairly straightforward, right? We want to basically um, do things in such a way that it's hard for the sensor to discover, right, and also hard to disrupt. So we can use sort of standard image hiding techniques to make discovery difficult, and we can use um, sort of more redundancy style technique, redundancy and erasure coding techniques to make disruption tough. What I'm going to spend a little bit of time on is, is these latter two challenges. In particular, how does Bob figure out where he should put this thing, right? Like where, you know, what, what content should he, he put it in? Where should he drop it so that Alice can find it, right? What we want to do is make the process of Alice fetching this cover traffic deniable, right? Something that she would do anyway so that if the sensor is watching, right, this would look just, just sort of normal, right? Okay, so where to embed this, right? Well, of course, Alice could go looking everywhere, right? She could just download all of Flickr, maybe, and, and look at every picture and see, is my message here? Is it there? No, it's not there. Well, this is not an option, right, um, for a variety of reasons. So Alice and Bob somehow have to agree on some subset of content um, without immediately communicating with one another. And they've got to do this, in a, as I mentioned, in a way such that when Alice does this, it's, it's deniable. So here's basically how we, do, how we create that deniable embedding. What we do is we take these, these message identifiers, let's say a URL, right, and we put this basically into some ID space. What we want to do then is identify some kind of tasks, right, that Alice would perform anyway, right? So we pick some things that she would do, right? Look at Bob's vacation photos or, you know, watch videos of cats or, you know, um, look at pictures of blue flowers or something. We put those on, on in this ID space as well. And what we do then is we sort of map the message identifier that corresponds to that content to the tasks that Alice would need to perform to retrieve the cover traffic which contains that content. So for example, these tasks might be something like, as I mentioned, right, search for blue flowers or you know, look at a particular set of images or videos. Um, and then by doing those particular things, which she's likely to do anyway, 
right? Then she's able to get the stuff that she really cares about. Okay, so um, as you might imagine, so that's basically the general idea. As you might imagine, this does not perform, you know, uh, super quickly, right? This is this is basically good for things like you know publishing an article or sending a message. Um, it will depending on how deniable you want this to be and how aggressive Alice is at fetching all kinds of stuff or how quickly she does this. And this can take on the order of minutes for you know to grab a you know fairly small message, but but presumably that's good enough for certain types of communication. Now. Um, Figuring out how to make this type of communication more real time and yet still deniable is it, it remains an open challenge. I want to spend like a couple minutes just closing up uh, talking about this 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 last challenge. Yes. So Bob has to know something about Alice's activities. Uh, Alice needs to know something about where Bob is going to put these things. So the, the the way that they do that is you can kind of view this mapping of tasks to identifiers as like a dictionary of sorts. So Alice, so the, the thing that they both agree on which is where you know, the bootstrapping has to occur, is that common message identifier. So Bob's going to put stuff in a certain place based on that, and Alice is going to fetch it based on that. Um, yeah. So that's, that's sort of the common language that they have to speak in order for that to work. OK. So um, I just want to, yes? If, if they can bootstrap, why don't they use the same mechanism to just exchange the message directly? Presumably, like the bootstrap mechanism is going to be smaller than uh, the message itself. Uh, but you're right. I mean, you potentially need another mechanism to pass that bootstrapped information. And if, yeah, if you had a perfect bootstrapping mechanism, you wouldn't need such a system in the first place. But the idea here would be that <clears throat> you might not need to pass that over the network at all. So for example, I could say, hey, the message ID that I'm going to first Let's say that we meet in person, right, in a dark alley or something. And I say the message ID that, that I'm going to first send you a message on is like, you know, 129, right? So, so now we're good, right? So, based on that, now you can maybe fetch uh, larger, you know, bigger messages. I could even send you a new set of message IDs or even a new mapping once we've got that initial bootstrap. So that I think that's the that's the trick there is size. Um, okay, so just a couple of minutes. Um, Talking about this this last challenge, which um, I'll just pose um, like pose a position for you. I think we've seen in sort of uh, recent times uh, a lot of governments essentially restricting communications in various ways. So, for example, we saw, for example, with the you know Iranian elections, the blocking of Twitter, etc. Uh, we saw the Egyptians, you know, completely shut down the network. Um, I would posit that as governments get more savvy about how to use the network, they're not going to shut it down, but rather use it to manipulate the information that we see, right, or that citizens see, right? Because why would you shut it down if you could use it to sort of influence public opinion or, um, you know, um, uh, tilt the outcome in your favor? So I think basically what I see as an, as, as an ongoing challenge is um, manipulation of content. And, and um, I'm going to talk just briefly for a couple minutes about a sort of more benign version of manipulation, but something that I think is, 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 is still relevant, and that's personalization. Right? So um, in, the, um, in the best case, right, we're seeing you know, many, many uh, organizations take our activities, our preferences, et cetera, and use that information to sort of whittle down what we see. So if we search for shoes, if we search for books or networking or whatever, then our past behavior, activities, et cetera, dictate the types of things that, that, uh, that, we're, that we're likely to see based on those interests. Now, in the best case, right, we're seeing things where, um, you, you know, we're seeing results that potentially are already tweaked towards things that we already agree with or already, you know, um, are already aligned with our own tastes and interests. And one can argue that that's good, right? I mean, there's certainly positives to that. But there is a flip side to that as well, which is that, we don't have control over, over, over how that's being done, and we actually don't even know sometimes what, you know, what's, you know, what we're missing. So one of the things that I'm looking at now is how to provide users better visibility and control into how that, how that, uh, you know, how that uh, sort of restriction or filtering is being done, if you will. Um, I'm going to just describe, this is uh, very much work in progress, so I'm going to just take like a, a minute or two to describe kind of the low-hanging fruit uh, that we're doing here. So, We've started off looking at search. In particular, when you, when you search, your, your question might be, well, what are, what are other people seeing when they search for the same term, right? Um, or you might actually want to run the same query in different ways, maybe as different personas or something like that. So we're starting off with something very, sim very, very simple, which is to say, take a query, 
right? And then run it from different geographies, right, as different users, and basically see what turns up, what shows up on the first page, where, you know, where does it show up, what doesn't show up. When it doesn't appear, can we explain, can we explain those things? Um, okay, so, um, and in particular, um, uh, let's see if, um, oh, I had, a, I had Ratul in here. Damn, I used the wrong slide. Well, let's, let's use Arvind. Um, so, you can, um, I was going to pick on Ratul uh, since he wasn't here, but, but uh, so I'll give you a, a different example. Um, so if we search for Arvind, uh, a professor at uh, University of Washington, you'll basically get a bunch of search results, right? Um, but what this Chrome plugin that we've built does is actually tell you other things that you didn't see, right? Other, other, uh, other, other search results that came up in a particular user's top 10, um, depending on where that search was run. So, Right now, we've basically built this tool, which is called Bobble, right, that allows you to basically see um, um, search results from other kinds of perspectives. Um, in particular, in this, it, we're basically just focused on, on geography so far with the tool. But as we work on this, we're expanding it to, to look at sort of you know, how these uh, queries differ based on your past search history um, you know, and other types of context that you, that you, might, um, uh, that you might imagine. So. Um, uh, Ultimately, uh, so this is basically just the first step, right? Because we're, we're looking at how to improve visibility. Ultimately, though, you might imagine a tool where a user actually um, provides some feedback or control into the types of results they see. So an example of that might be, I might want to run a query as a particular you know, persona or as a particular group. So for example, the, the, the results that I see when I search, say, for example, Seattle, right, I might want the results to differ based on whether I'm querying as a, you know, a food connoisseur or a marathon runner or a networking researcher or what have you. I might want to see, you know, see different types of things. So that's the type of direction I see this, this work going. So um, just in conclusion, right, uh, I've talked about how, um, how different, different parties are vying for control of information on the internet in, in a variety of different ways. And I've spent a, probably the majority of the time talking about um, work that we've done to combat message abuse, but I've also talked about other problems relating to both uh, censorship and, and just more recently looking at how different tools and, and um, uh, um, algorithms may, may ultimately be used to manipulate the types of information that we do or don't see. And I'm working on ways to, to sort of um, tilt, the, tilt the balance back in the, in the hands of the user as well. So thank you very much. Um, So, I mean, message filtering has been a long history of, you know, just cat and mouse and cat and mouse. I mean, yeah. you know, you, uh, particularly the content-based, you know, filtering level stuff has, you know, has, seems to have merely trained the population to, to get, you know, clever about it. Is there grounds for optimism that there are intrinsic things in the kind of network level approaches that you described that would put, you know, that would give us tools that are beyond the reach of their ability to adapt? Yeah, this is something I think requires, I mean, it, it bears a little bit more um, formal study. But I would say, um, informally, we'd like to look for features that are uh, more costly for adversaries to adapt to, right? So if we look at content, for example, it's fairly, fairly low cost to change the way that a message gets encoded or embedded. If we look at network level features, um, yeah, things, uh, it, adversaries can still adapt, right? In particular, if we look at the behavioral features that, that, that I showed, right, you could certainly send spam from less dense, you know, you know in a less dense way. But, Presumably there's, I mean, lurking behind that, we assume that there's some cost to adaptation. Um, and on both sides, right? And by, for, to take that example in particular, if, if you were to say that you can only send, send spam from you know, a certain number of IP addresses within a range before you sort of trip, uh, before you sort of trip some detector, then um, presumably you've imposed some kind of cost, right? either in sort of redu maybe in reduced volume, right, certainly for a region of space. Um, I don't know how to model that cost. I think it would be a very interesting problem to sort of try to figure out, okay, now how can we actually model um, an adversary? On the, fl on the flip side, actually, I think there's, like on the sensor side as well, you could ask the exact same question, right? It's like, yes, but how do we know that the sensor isn't going to adapt to try to detect the techniques that, that I showed? And I think, again, there's like a really interesting question in trying to model the capabilities of the adversary. In theory, the, adver like the detector in that case is unbounded. Right? It could do just about anything. It could look at the fact that you never send mail at, 
or you never you never browse the web at 3 a.m. on Sundays, right? It's a harder model because right? it's not an economic motivation, so it's harder to kind of you know say exactly. what level of. Exactly. I mean, the guy in exactly. Syria is probably exactly. willing to go to greater lengths than a spammer Thanks. to get his yeah. stuff yeah. get done what he wants to get done. Right? Mm -hmm. It is. Um, it's a tough. It's potentially a tougher thing to model, particularly if you think if you if you view a government as having like unbounded resources to throw at the problem, then it then it is certainly trickier. If we you could potentially do the economic model if you talk about instead of a, you know, a government with potentially unbounded resources. If you talk about say, um, folks who are interested in DRM, for example, like they have a certain amount. I mean, there are economics at play in those kind of uh, situations. Yeah, seemingly, seemingly, yeah. But uh, yeah, I think on on either problem that you look at, there's sort of like more work to be done in terms of model modeling the adversary. Let's thank you.